The title of my talk, Dispelling the Lies that the Psychedelic Community Believes About Drugs, uh, actually, Julie wrote that. Uh, <laughs> in fact, Julie wrote the abstract. Apparently, it's a big deal that you have an abstract in the title before you give a talk. I, I didn't know that. Uh, so, uh, I'm happy to be here before you all, and I'm really happy that you all are here and you stayed around because you all could be doing some, something else, like getting high. <laughs> I know I would be if I didn't have to do this, but... <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all uh, for, for staying and being here. Nick Powers spoke here a couple years ago, and Nick issued a challenge. Well, he raised the question. He asked the question of whether or not he was simply tokenism, or was this some, some sort of meaningful inclusion? And he, and he said, you know, we'll see. And so I think one of the reasons that I'm here is because of Nick's comments, and thank you, Nick. I don't, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, thank you. And Nick gave a great talk, and so I just wanted to Give a shout out to Nick. Um, now, what I I don't um, I don't really care about your inclusion, whether this is tokenism. I, I don't care. Um, I'm 53 years old this month, and I lived in this country long enough enough to know the bullshit. So I don't spare me that. Uh, but what I do care about is that we behave like we say we, like Americans like we say we are, in terms of fairness and justice and liberty. That's all I care about. If we do those sort of things, people will be fine. And that's what this talk really deals with. And it deals with this subject because I have been writing a book recently um, and this book has taken me on a geographical as well as intellectual journey. And this journey started uh, with research that I've been doing at Columbia for the past 21 years, where we bring people into the lab and we give them drugs in order to study the effects of drugs, in order to help people maybe with treatment and those sorts of things, uh, in order to understand what these drugs do and don't do. That's where the journey started, but then the journey has taken me around the globe, uh, and I just want to say something that James Baldwin said, that when you go on a journey, you don't know what you will discover, nor do you know what what you discover will do to you. You know, you don't know what you'll discover and you'll know what you'll do with it or, you, or what it will do to you. I'm here to tell you today about my journey and what I discovered. One of the first things that I discovered on this long sort of journey is that when we talk about psychoactive drugs, whether they are psychedelics, by the way, the classifications, the way we do that sort of thing, it's arbitrary and uh, exclusionary and elitist. Uh, so when I talk about drugs, I'm talking about the psychoactive drugs like MDMA, yes, like heroin, yes, like crack cocaine, yes, all of these drugs together. One of the things that I discovered is that the predominant effects of these drugs, this is after having given thousands of, thousands of doses of these drugs in the laboratory, the predominant effects are positive. But this is not the sort of narrative that we have. I mean, you look throughout the scientific literature, this is a paper published by Harriet DeWitt at the University of Chicago. She does excellent work. She's been studying drugs for a number of years. The effects that she's found predominantly, the effects that we found predominantly are positive. And even when you take something like crack cocaine, this is just one of the older studies that we have had. One of the sort of myths or the lies that I was told about crack cocaine was that 
when people are addicted to the drug, it is really difficult to shift their behavior away from taking the drug. And so one of the things that we did was we did a simple study based on the work of Bruce Alexander, Rat Park. Uh, we did a simple study. We gave people an alternative. These are people who meet criteria for crack uh, addiction according to the DSM. We gave them a simple alternative, crack or $5. They chose drug on about the same number of occasions that they chose money. It, what it told me was that, wow, something as little as $5 could shift people's drug-taking behavior away. What if you increase the amount of money? We increase the amount of money <laughs> to $20. We increase the amount of money to $20. And we did another drug, methamphetamine, because at the time, Methamphetamine was the new evil drug in the United States. When you increase the amount of money to something like $20, they almost never take methamphetamine. They take money. It's rational. People who do drugs, even people who are addicted to drugs, can and do behave rationally. I know some of you smart people will say, like, well, maybe they just took the money from you and waited <laughs> and went out and got high with your $20 or 20 plus dollars. Yeah, that's a possibility. But at the time, one of the things that we were saying was that people who are addicted to methamphetamine were cognitively impaired. They couldn't inhibit. They couldn't engage in executive cognitive functioning, those sorts of things. It requires a lot of executive cognitive functioning to hold on to your money, go make a plan to find your dealer and so forth. Those are good things. So if they went and got high, they earned the money. <laughs> Who am I to tell them that they can't spend their money like they like to spend their money? As long as they're not interrupting somebody else's liberty. It's a good thing, right? Now, I want to be clear here. I don't want to minimize the potential negative effects of these drugs that I'm talking about because there are some serious potential negative consequences. That's a fact. But the point that I'm trying to make is that the predominant effects are positive. Now, one of the things that society has done, and I resent, is that I am forced to talk predominantly about the negative effects, which constitute a small uh, proportion of the effects. But I'm forced to talk, engage in uh, talking about these negative effects. I know some in medicine and psychiatry, you all like that because you seem to be, appear to like being God or feeling like you can help people or, or that sort of thing. That's cool, that's not what I do. That's not what I do, but I should say Overdose is very real, particularly in light of our current so-called opioid crisis, which I hate that term, uh, the, but the, that's what we, we are calling it, the opioid crisis. But let's talk about the overdoses. I have to talk about this. Now, 2017, these are some data from activities in which people engage, taking opioids, shooting a gun, driving an automobile, the numbers of deaths you can see, when people die from, the number of people who die from an opioid-related death is 47,600. The number of people who die from a heroin-related death, about 15,000. Gun-related deaths, 40,000. Automobiles, 40,000. Just to give you some context in terms of Americans dying from various activities. By the way, in life, if you engage in anything that's worth doing, there is risk attached to it. This notion that we can get rid of all risk is bullshit. And so that we're, I don't, uh, so I hope you all understand that I'm not there, I'm here. Still, let's think about this opioid situation. Cause still, all right, if we can help people, how do we do it? Now, the thing that is important to understand when we, when we think about the opioids, it's a real concern, but it's not well understood what's going on. 
The thing that we know is that people rarely die from heroin alone. They typically die from combining opioids with other sedatives. That's a reason that people die. The older antihistamines like promethazine uh, induces a lot of sedation. Uh, large doses of, of, of those drugs combined with opioids certainly are not good. Alcohol, certainly not good. So we can simply make sure that the public's aware of combining these different types of sedatives could potentially be lethal. But the opioids in and of themselves are not necessarily the thing that's dangerous. Unless, of course, we are talking about fentanyl analogs, fentanyl and analogs, and people are unaware that they are taking fentanyl, thinking that they're taking something like heroin, the fentanyl analogs are a lot more potent, meaning that it requires less amount in order to induce an effect, including overdose. So that's a problem. If people unsuspectingly take fentanyl, thinking it's something like heroin, yeah, that's a real problem. But those problems are solvable. Those problems are solvable. We can solve those problems simply by implementing as they do in Europe in a number of places, also in Canada, our neighbors from the north, implementing drug consumption rooms. In these drug consumption rooms, people are monitored. You have medical personnel who could help reverse an overdose if that happens, also help with drug education, thinking about these drug combinations, we could do this, but we haven't, because in America, when it comes to drugs, we are moralist. We want to make sure we control the pleasure that people seek to have. This is very simple. This is very simple. It's not complicated at all. Another thing that we can do, if we don't want to do the drug consumption rooms, we could, at the very least, implement these anonymous free drug purity uh, testing uh, centers. Uh, I think tomorrow you guys will hear from Fiona from the UK. She's from the, the Loop. They, they, they do these drug testing sort of things. Uh, people submit small amount of their drugs. They get a chemical printout analysis of what what, what, the, what, the, what the compound contains, if it contains one of the fentanyl a, uh, analogs, you take less of it or you don't take it. It gives the person the information to make the decision. It gives the person agency, the thing that we are trying to prevent people from having. In a country that started because of the Declaration of Independence, that says that we all have the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. There are other potential negative effects. Of course, addiction, I know. Uh, uh, people worry about addiction. I uh, just want to let you all know that I'm, a, I'm concerned about addiction too, uh, but addiction is one of those things that um, is not as common as we think. Uh, most of the people who use drugs are responsible people. Um, 75 to 90 percent of the people who use drugs don't have a problem. Most of them pay taxes, take care of their children. Uh, they even agree to give lectures on a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> And they even become president of the United States. <laughs> All three of these men, of course, used illegal drugs when they were young men. Not to besmirch their reputation or anything like that. They all did a fine job of that themselves. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> the point that I'm trying to make is that this guy said he never used drugs. <laughs>
Maybe he should, right? No. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is this. I, you know, I, the intellectual energy of our country has been waylaid, hijacked too much by this fella, and so we're not doing it today. Um, so we're moving on. The point here is this. If the vast majority of people who use any particular drug do not become addicted, then you can't blame the drug for drug addiction, as we so often like to do. We vilify heroin, we vilify methamphetamine, we vilify crack cocaine, we do all of those sorts of things. You can't blame those drugs when the majority of those users don't become addicted. So the question is, like, okay, well, why do people become addicted? It's simple. There are these predictive factors that we know. But the problem is that it requires that the therapist, the assessing therapist, the person who is evaluating the individual, must give a comprehensive, comprehensive assessment of the person. This is critical. This takes hours sometimes. It can take hours. And then you figure out what is driving the pathological use or the disruptions that's caused in the person's life. One of the things that we know is that people who have mental illnesses, untreated mental illnesses, traumas, and so forth, they are more likely to maybe have problems related to taking drugs if those mental, mental health or physical problems are not dealt with. If you deal with those issues, it goes a long way in treating what looks like a drug-related problem. It's not that complicated. But it means that we have to take the shackles off of our brains about how evil heroin is or about how evil crack cocaine is. That's what it means. And we also, we know poverty, whether it's academic poverty, whether it's financial poverty, whether it's homelessness, all of these sorts of things also contribute to whether or not someone will meet criteria for substance use disorder. Again, if we deal with these issues, the drug problem becomes less of a problem. <laughs> now, we also, there, there, we have people who have a lot of financial means, and they also sometimes meet criteria for substance use disorder. And so people oftentimes say, like, well, what about those folks? I think about people who have had problems with uh, substances, and they have a lot of financial means. I mean, you could think about... Um, uh, uh, some entertainer. Somebody said Robert Downey Jr. Certainly you can, I didn't want to, I don't, I don't want to put the brother on blast. So I'm trying not to put anybody on blast uh, because I don't know his situation and that's not fair. Uh, even Rush Limbaugh, I can't do that. You know, uh, that's not fair. Uh, how about Donald? No, no. Uh, the point is, you can imagine if somebody has a lot of means, particularly if they have a lot of means and they have these unrealistic expectations and they can't be seen using drugs, they have to hide, they have, because they have this image to uphold on the one hand, you can see how that can cause some problems that might cause some pathological use. Or you can think about some young person who was a star from a very young age and having to uh, support the family or no longer is doing as well as they once were. People aren't doing everything for them. They didn't learn the skills to inhibit their behaviors in certain domains. You can see how all of these things can become problematic. But we oftentimes don't look past the headlines when we see some celebrity who's having a problem. Instead, we look at the drug or if we don't like the celebrity, like you all said, Rush Limbaugh, you know, and you just point it to that person. And so uh, all of these factors are critically important when it comes to addiction. Now, one of the factors that is less important, but it gets all of this attention, is this brain disease model of drug addiction. 
This is the new sort of dogma in this field. Now, when I say drug addiction is a brain disease model, what I'm talking about is that there are neurobiological markers that differentiate non-substance use disorder people from those who meet criteria for substance use disorder. So there are biological markers, neurobiological markers. That's the sort of basics of this idea. And this is a paper published by Nora Balkal, who is the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Uh, and in this paper, I just have a quick quote from this paper. This paper is published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you all know anything about science, it's one of the top medical journals. Uh, and this is just a quote. It says, if early volunteer drug use goes unchecked or undetected and unchecked, the resulting changes in the brain can ultimately erode a person's ability to control impulses to take drugs. Where are the data to support this statement? What does this mean? This is a scientific journal. This is just speculative bullshit. I don't even know what this means. I don't, I don't know if it, I don't know how you measure that. I don't know what that means. Now, I want to talk about the brain disease model of drug addiction because it's important. When I think about drug addiction as a brain disease, I think about Parkinson's disease, I think about Huntington's disease. I started my career studying Parkinson's disease. Now, when I think about these two diseases, brain, these are things that we consider brain disease. They're progressive, irreversible, fatal. Uh, you can see sometimes the, in the, the striatal pathways, you can see uh, as the, the disease progresses, progresses, you can see the clinical med manifestation. You can see this. People will die from these illnesses. They're, they are irreversible. We think about drug addiction. The majority of people who are addicted to drugs recover without treatment. And we don't see these, neuro, these neurobiological correlates. You can't tell from somebody's brain who is addicted versus somebody who's not. There's no evidence of that. I know you all believe there is, but there is no evidence of that. And I know where this notion comes from. This notion comes from laboratory data, laboratory animal data in which we have given large doses of methamphetamine or any amphetamine to an animal and you can cause some neurotoxicity, to some neural damage uh, to these neurons. That's large doses given to naive animals. Doses that are 10, 20, 40 times that what humans take. Now, when you allow the animal to become tolerant by escalating the dose over time slowly, you block these effects. And you don't see these effects when you give doses that are equivalent to what humans take. Now, one of the things that we did or, and, uh, uh, back in 2012 is that we looked at the literature on methamphetamine and neuroimaging and cognitive functioning to see, to try to find out if there were differences in the brains of people who met criteria for methamphetamine abuse and those who did not. We found about a 20, 10 to 20% differences in binding potential uh, in dopamine rich areas, which looks like it was in the normal range of human variability, especially when you look at cognitive functioning. Their cognitive functioning was in the normal range of human functioning. Bottom line, the differences that people say constitute a brain, constitute a brain sort of disease is within the normal human range of variability. That's what the evidence says. This is in the literature. You can go look at all of the papers yourself. Don't look at what I say or what they say. Look at the data. The data don't lie. I also published something in a popular sort of science magazine, American Scientist, to try and help the public understand this in lay terms. I published uh, something in Nature on the same issue, only about a thousand words. You can check it out. It's an easy sort of thing to understand. 
Uh, another thing that I learned was that drugs are used to scapegoat people so those in authority don't have to deal with the real problems that poor people face and authorities can explicitly go at the people we don't like without saying so. And they're also used to scapegoat by drug elitist. My drug is better than your drug. You do heroin, I do ayahuasca, I'm better. <laughs> I, I just want to give, just want to remind us of an example that we all know from the 1980s. In 1986, we passed the infamous crack powder laws where we punished crack cocaine violations 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine violations, meaning that people could, would, would have to go to jail for a minimum sentence of five years for a small amount of crack. To do the same thing for powder, you had to have 100 times more powder cocaine. That law was passed in 86. It was extended in 1988. And in the 88 law, it said something that was really interesting. It said by 1995, the United States would be drug free. <laughs> this was actually written in law. This is crazy. Crazy. That this is just the difference between crack and powder. You focus your attention on the left, that's powder cocaine. On the right, that's crack cocaine. The only difference is on the, on the left, the red circle, the hydrochloride group, it adds nothing to the biological or the pharmacological effects of the drug, just showing you that they're the same drug. But when you look at who's being arrested, who got arrested, particularly in the 80s and the 90s, 90% 90 of the people who were arrested were black people, even though they didn't constitute the majority of the crack users they constituted the overwhelming majority of the people arrested under these laws. People were upset. Uh, Bill Clinton, uh, George Bush II, they both rejected the recommendations of the U.S. Sentencing Commission and kept the law the same. C along comes Barack Obama in 2007, running for president. He said that judges think that's wrong. He also said that Republicans think that's wrong, Democrats think that's wrong, and yet it's been approved by Republicans and Democratic presidents because nobody's been willing to brave the politics and make it right. That will change when I'm president. Question is, did it change? Well, kind of. In the Obama way, it kind of. Uh, <laughs> it went from uh, 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 being punished from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. And so um, the, the, the disparity was decreased, uh, but I think Malcolm X said it best, posthumously of course, when he said that if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six, that's not progress. <laughs> now I want to fast forward to heroin. Now the traffickers, these are people that take drugs. These are guys are the name D-Money, Smoothie, Shifty, uh, these type of guys that come from Connecticut, New York. They come up here, they sell their heroin, then they go back home. Incidentally, half the time they impregnate a young white girl before they leave. That was the uh, governor of Maine, Paul LePage, speaking, I believe, in 2016. He was speaking on, on this issue, and what LePage did was he was stupid enough to say how we carry out drug law enforcement. Everybody in the country knows how we carry it out, but he was just stupid enough to say it. At some level, maybe he wasn't stupid enough, maybe he was courageous enough, and the rest of us are cowards. Because that's how it's been carried out in the country. 80% of the people who are arrested at the federal level for opioid-related uh, charges are black even though they don't constitute 80% of the dealers. Even though they don't constitute 80% of the users, we know that. But this is just how we get down in this country, we know that. Now, but that's, that's heroin. When you think about something like scapegoating drugs like cannabis, these are all the people who recently died as a result of cannabis and their interactions with a law enforcement personnel or a proxy. 
And the proxy or the law enforcement personnel said that they smelled cannabis or something, and therefore that constituted sort of an intimate, intimate risk or danger, and these people all lost their lives. Now, uh, let's come back to our community here, psychedelics. Ketamine, Elias Dakwa gave a great talk earlier on ketamine. Ketamine and PCP, ketamine is a derivative, a derivative of PCP. PCP is a psychedelic. It's a psychedelic that we disown in this community. Now, ketamine we love because as a doc, uh, Elias Dakwa showed, we're, uh, it's showing all these beneficial effects and then people like it recreationally. But PCP, this community has been silent when it comes to the vilification of PCP. Uh, when people say things like PCP causes uh, violence, agitation, and all of those sorts of things, it's just simply not true. This is a paper done by John Morgan, the late John Morgan and colleagues, going through the literature showing that this connection between PCP and violence is just unfounded. We know that. We know this in medicine and science. We know this. But yet and still, we have Laquan McDonald in Chicago being shot 16 times by a Chicago police officer. And the justification was initially, at least for like a year, that he was on PCP. PCP, you guys might remember the LA riots when, well, when the LAPD beat Rodden King. They said they believed he was on PCP. You might remember Tulsa, Oklahoma, 2016, I believe, Terrence uh, Crutcher uh, shot and killed by the Oklahoma police, said that he was on PCP, offered as a justification, a psychedelic. The question is, where the hell is the community when these things are used as justification? I just have to tell you, this is just LaGuan McDonald walking down the street, walking away from the cops, and the cops, the one cop, opened fire 16 times, shooting him as he is, the smoke is going. And then uh, we see in the Chicago Tribune, other papers, PCP is used to justify such a thing. Um, community salad. MDMA, methamphetamine, this is just a slide of methamphetamine is on the left, MDMA is on the right, MDMA is an amphetamine. Uh, this is one of the studies we did with methamphetamine and MDMA. They have a lot of overlapping effects. Obviously, they have some differential effects, but they're amphetamines, and they produce good effects. But yet, methamphetamine is vilified, and the community has been quiet, silent, mute. This is Duterte. You all might know his drug war. He's killed thousands of people because of methamphetamine suspected of using methamphetamine, suspected of dealing methamphetamine. He believes that one, at the, using methamphetamine for one year, it shrinks a person's brain, and therefore that person is no longer viable for rehabilitation. Where did he get such nonsense? Well, he reads the scientific literature and some of the stuff that some of the re researchers are saying, which is nonsense. That's why it's important to look at the data. And this, is, and this is justifying his war on drugs. And I went to the Philippines to say just that. And they ran me out of town. Okay. They ran me out of town. And the Sunday I was there, they ran a cartoon making fun of me. And those are methamphetamine users supposedly in the audience clapping and their brains are shrunk. And this is me <laughs> talking. But this sort of thing is happening all around the world. In Brazil, they have their war on crack cocaine. They're about 30 years behind us. But crack is their new enemy. New, uh, new Jack Rio. Uh, in Brazil, they kill five, their police kill five black men every day. Not every week, not every month, not every year, every day. So I've been on this journey, traveling all around the world, thinking about drugs. 
And this journey has changed me. It's changed me to the point that I am tired of people trying to regulate people's ability to enjoy themselves psychoactively. I have to say I'm talking about adults, of course. Some idiot is going to say, you're saying children should use drugs. I never say that about alcohol. I'm talking about adults. So when I think about this sort of thing, I mean, I know we couch it in medical terms. The medicine, we're helping us. Come on. Uh, <laughs> the document that founded the country, in all, it's a beautiful document. I invite you to, to read it. The first sentence, it asserts this liberty that we all have. And in the second sentence, it says that government should be created for the sole purpose of protecting those liberties, not restricting them. So read the document. Now, I have to quote Thomas Jefferson. Now, I know there are some problems with Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> I, I get that. But that does not discount when he says something brilliant. Nor does it discount the fact that he was great at plagiarizing John Locke and those people. With that, so that does. The point is, he said that if people let governments decide which foods they eat and medicines they take, their bodies will soon be in as sorry as a state as their, the souls of those under tyranny. I have no interest in being like that. So this is what we should do. We should fight for implementing regulatory schemes that permit adult use. It will ensure quality control, decrease some of these deaths, certainly accidents, it'll generate jobs, and it'll be inconsistent with this notion of freedom. Americans always talk about we're the freest country in the world, and they've never been anywhere. <laughs> we have started to do this with cannabis, and I'm happy to see this. Canada, Uruguay, of course, they've done it as well. And of course, we'll need to have better psychopharmacology education that goes along with this. This is a given, but I have to say this for people who, yeah. We, obviously, we need to have better education. And I'm trying to participate in this with books, articles, and all of these sort of things that I'm writing and saying. I'm trying to help people live a more healthy, happy life that they are in control of, not that medicine is in control of. So how do we get here? How do we get here? Well, we require people to have evidence when they speak about drugs. There's too often people are allowed to engage in this conversation purely with anecdote. We have to require that people have evidence. And we, ha we also have to have respectable people who go to work every day, take care of their families, people who are pillars of their community, come out of the closet about your drug use. I have gotten down with so many people around the world. Of course, I'm not, I'm not going to put anybody on blast. That's not what I do. But I know who you are. <laughs> No, it's just, yeah, and we have to guard against this issue here, this drug elitism, thinking that your drug is better than somebody else's drug. Whatever works for that person, that's fine. Now, we have to do this thing that I think that's really important. I think we have to engage in civil disobedience. There are so many people who say, 
if I was around when King was here, I would be marching with King. Or I marched with King. I did this with King. This is the King moment. This is where civil disobedience is needed. King said that it's our responsibility to disobey unjust laws. These laws that regulate drugs, they're unjust. It's our moral responsibility, our civic duty to do this. Now, I understand that as we move forward, that we have to retrain and redirect the efforts of the prohibitionists. I don't want to put people out of work. And we have created this huge law enforcement apparatus. We will have to retrain them. We will have to retrain physicians. We will have to retrain people. I will now have to wrap up and I have to allow for short speeches that are disguised <laughs> as questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I was wondering what you thought about the current drug scheduling system and when you talk about opening up regulation for uh, legal recreational drug use for adults, what would you, I mean, how would you exactly implement that? Uh, I wasn't thinking about putting this in the drug scheduling system. Uh, does California put cannabis in the drug scheduling system? No. That's what I was thinking about. Uh, Is it just open? Yeah, I, uh, we put a man on the moon. This ain't that complicated. I mean, we figure it out. I mean, alcohol is, well, nicotine. Nicotine is one of the most toxic substances known to humans, but we package it in a way that we control the dose. Each dose unit will not kill you. So we can control the dose units and that sort of stuff. It's one of the things I've heard a lot is MDMA like burns holes in your brain or it screws up your dopamine receptors. So I was just curious, is there any, you know, there's, and that's just one example of many different kind of things you hear. And I'm, I'm just curious if there's any, uh, science behind that. So I'm 53 now and I've heard this stuff about 25 years and it, it really wears me out. Uh, no, um, it's true. As I pointed out, MDMA is an amphetamine. If you push the dose large enough, you certainly can get some neurotoxicity. But the effect, when you start by that time in humans, uh, this is going to be really unpleasant, and people are not going to do that again. That they may not be around to do that again. The doses that we use as humans, certainly there are no evidence to show that you have some toxicity. Um, no, there's no evidence at doses that humans take. I don't know, I've, I've had cocaine trips or methamphetamine trips in which I had really cool insights. So my question is, do you believe that these substances that we call recreational could also have therapeutic value, that you could actually attend oh. co with cocaine or methamphetamine certain uh, mental health issues? I I'm struggling with that term myself. Uh, calling it recreational kind of is dismissive because there are more things going on than recreational. Uh, but I don't have a better term, but I absolutely agree with you. Um, for example, um, Billie Holiday, the famous jazz singer, uh, was asked about, you know, did heroin shorten her life maybe? And Billie Holiday lived into her 40s. And she said that her parents, who were killed in their 20s, um, she said that, look, my parents never touched heroin or a drug. And heroin has helped me to live longer. It certainly has helped me to not kill another person. And I know that feeling. I was the chair of my department and I know that feeling. If I remember correctly, at one point you uh, held a position of decriminalization yeah. rather than legalization. Oh. 
Yeah. And I was happy to hear that you, you shifted to a, a legalization yeah. position some months ago. I'm wondering what, what was the tipping point for you? We all make mistakes, and so we have to leave room for people to grow. Uh, but people have to be open. And I think that uh, the thing where I changed from decriminalization was um, going around the world and, and even in New York City. Like, marijuana has been decriminalized in the state for some time, but we still arrest people. In Brazil, they decriminalized all drugs in 2006, but yet their prison, for drug, uh, prison rate for drug incarceration has increased since decriminalization. Because, you know, uh, users we won't arrest, but dealers will arrest. And if you look like a dealer, you're a dealer, no matter how much drug you have. And so I see that decriminalization is just being used as another tool to police certain people, one. And two, decriminalization does nothing to deal with the adul adulterants that, drug that, that are contained in some illicit drugs. And so the only way to really do it right is to legally regulate the market. That's what it was. Thanks for your talk. You spoke a lot about drug, eliminating drug elitism. Um, do you feel that, any, that, that some drugs aren't inherently worse for the user than others? Inherently worse for the user than others? Why don't you give me an example? Because I'm, I'm trying to, I mean, if you're talking about something like MP, MPP plus. You talk about methamphetamine a lot, and that seems yeah, to have great, an inherently great. destructful consequences for a lot of the individuals who use it, and opioids even more so. Yeah, yeah well, you should probably broaden your scope of people who use it. Uh, you're looking at somebody who uses all, both of those drugs. Um, it, um, certainly, there are people who are having problems with those drugs. That's a fact. But a lot of those people may have had problems before. They got, I don't know their individual situation. I don't know the quality of drug they're taking. But no, I don't think that methamphetamine is somehow uniquely more toxic than MDMA, for example. I don't think that, no. The uh, biggest social anxiety at the moment about drug addiction seems to be with teenage vaping. And I'd like your comments on that. Ethan Naderman is now into this um, uh, vaping. And the question is related to teenage vaping. Uh, my youngest kid is now, what year is this? It's 2019, Carl. My youngest kid is 18, 18, 18. Yeah, my youngest kid is 18. Um, and it was hard being a parent. And I had to do that job myself. And I didn't want the government doing that for me. And so I try to stay away from teenage drug use because it's illegal. And it's illegal for reasons that our society has agreed. We can argue about that. But I'm not going to do the work of other parents. And so when we are worried about teenage vaping, vaping, the only thing I can say is parents be parents. That's not what I'm worried about. Thank you, Carl Hart, very much for an enlightening presentation. This is what we expected.